Dirty facts about ancient Greece you didn't know. Once a year in Athens, the city's streets turned into a lively parade of, well, you guessed it, phalluses. Men and women proudly paraded through town, hoisting colossal phalli in the air to pay homage to their wine-loving deity, Dionysus. It was all part of a Dionysian bash, where people got as drunk as a skunk and led a naughty phallic procession to the temple, serenading their way with songs about private parts and cracking risque jokes at unsuspecting folks. But wait, there's more. Slaves in ancient Greece endure something called Called infibulation. That meant that metal rings were snugly wrapped around their genitals, making any form of excitement a painful endeavor. And the only way to release the lock was with a special key. Talk about a real-life escape room. Now, for the grand finale of absurdity, sneezing as a birth control method. Yes, you read that right. The Greek physician Soranus once advocated that post-lovemaking, all a woman needed to do was squat, sneeze, and rinse, and voila, no pregnancy. It's like they were taking a chew to a whole new level of contraception. Have you ever thought about why Genghis Khan didn't try to take over India, even though it was a rich and culturally diverse place? Well, there are some important reasons for that. First, there was a big natural barrier in the way. The land between Genghis Khan's empire and India was really tough to cross. His soldiers were used to open plains, not steep mountains and thick forests, so it would have been hard for them to get there. Also. Genghis Khan had his army spread out in different places, so it would have been difficult to organize a big attack on India. It was just too far away and too big to conquer all at once. Another reason is that Genghis Khan was smart. He knew how powerful the Delhi Sultanate is, and so, instead of fighting everyone, he understood the value of making friends with nearby empires that weren't a threat to his ongoing campaigns. This way, he could focus on expanding his empire in other directions without worrying about enemies on all sides the weirdest pregnancy test in history, the wheat and barley test. Long ago, in ancient Egypt, there was a very strange way to check if someone might be pregnant. They would advise women who thought they might be pregnant to pee on some wheat and barley seeds over the course of a few days. If the wheat started to grow, they believed it meant the person was going to have a girl. If the barley grew, they thought it meant a boy. And if nothing grew, it meant they weren't pregnant at all. Surprisingly, this weird test actually worked. In the 1960s, scientists tried it in a lab and found that about 70% of the time, the urine of pregnant people made the seeds grow, but the urine of non-pregnant people did not. The reasons behind this phenomenon are not entirely clear, but it's believed that the hormonal changes in the urine of pregnant individuals might have contributed to the seed growth. The ancient Egyptian wheat and barley test, though bizarre to our modern sensibilities, had a surprising degree of accuracy and was a testament to the ingenuity of ancient cultures. Islam's resolute resistance against Mongol aggression was exemplified in the Battle of Angelut, also known as the Battle of Goliath Spring, on September 3, 1260. Led by Sultan Kutuz and their renowned general Baibars, the Mamluks confronted the Mongols under the command of Kitbuka, a notable general serving Hulagu Khan in the Jezreel Valley. Although initially outnumbered, the Mongols held the advantage. Yet, Baibar's astute use of the terrain and effective hit-and-run tactics shifted the course of the battle. The Mamluks then launched a surprise assault, feigning retreat to catch the Mongols off guard. Arrows rained down upon the unsuspecting Mongols while they were attacked on their flanks by cavalry. This intense battle lasted for hours, resulting in heavy Mongol casualties. Ultimately, the Mamluks emerged victorious, forcing the Mongol army to retreat and halting their threat to Egypt and Syria. The Mamluks' triumph secured the survival of the Islamic world in the face of Mongol aggression. Did you know that February 15th marks the historical celebration of Lupercalia? This famous event, characterized by men running through the streets wearing garments made from sacrificed goats, a unique and vibrant expression of fertility and love. Lupercalia was a cherished annual tradition in ancient Rome, celebrated in honor of Faunus, the Roman god of agriculture, fertility, and shepherds. As part of the festivities, Men would run through the streets, their bodies draped in goatskin, searching for women. The goal was not to harm, but to playfully strike these women with leather thongs, known as februa. This act was thought to bring blessings of fertility, health, and safe childbirth to those touched. Being struck by the leather thongs was seen as a form of protection against infertility and the difficulties associated with childbirth. Over time, the festival of Lupercalia evolved and merged with other celebrations. Eventually, it transformed into the modern Valentine's Day, emphasizing love and affection rather than fertility rights. Did you know that the most successful pirate in history was a woman? Ching Shi, 
the world's most successful pirate was once a lowly prostitute in China. Fate led her to an unexpected union with the commander of the Red Flag Fleet. But their union was hardly your typical tale of love. Her husband valued her as an equal and saw her genuine potential. From that moment, Ching Shi's destiny changed at that point, and she started leading the fleet's pirates as an active commander. She handled the perilous waters with tactical genius and unyielding resolve, leading her brave crew to incredible wins. Her legacy goes beyond the confines of gender norms, demonstrating the unbreakable character of a woman who defied expectations and attained the highest levels of authority. All who dared to face Ching Shi were terrified as her name reverberated across the oceans. With each conquest, her legend grew, inspiring us that strength knows no gender, and greatness can emerge even from unexpected origins. During the Middle Ages, a period characterized by prevalent superstitious beliefs, there existed a particularly daunting superstition that instilled deep fear in the populace. A significant number of devout individuals who regularly attended church placed great reliance on the notion that churches served as sanctuaries against malevolent forces. However, it is intriguing to note that a widely circulated belief suggested the possibility of demonic possession if one were to inadvertently fall asleep within the sacred confines of a church during a mass. While a few accounts detailing such incidents were recorded, none have been definitively substantiated. There persists speculation that these rumors may have been intentionally propagated by the church itself, with the objective of ensuring unwavering attentiveness among the congregation during religious ceremonies. I cordially invite you to share your perspectives on whether these superstitions stem from actual experiences or if they represent a strategic ploy devised by the church. Was Alexander the Great buried alive? According to a recent study, the long-standing enigma surrounding Alexander the Great's passing has been solved. This paper claims that Alexander died from a rare autoimmune condition that slowly paralyzed his muscles, leaving him voiceless and motionless for six painful days. It means that the ancient Macedonian ruler was likely still alive while his loyal soldiers prepared his body for burial in 323 BC. His muscles were paralyzed to the point that doctors couldn't see he was still breathing, meaning he was pronounced dead nearly a week early. Alexander the Great, a celebrated military genius, had established the largest empire in the ancient world through a series of remarkable conquests. Against odds, his army conquered Persian provinces, Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt, unscathed. However, his enigmatic death at 32 in Babylon baffled historians for years, with theories spanning typhoid, alcohol, and poisoning. Did you know that in 1494, Europe experienced the closest thing to a real-life zombie outbreak? This forgotten and gloomy chapter existed amidst the brilliant splendor of Italy's Renaissance. As the Age of Discovery progressed, brave sailors returning from the New World unintentionally brought a terrible plague. This silent intruder found its way into the ranks of an entire French army, which then became the unwitting carriers, spreading the great pox throughout Europe. The disease was permitted to spread unabated at the time due to the absence of medical developments. The results were nothing short of terrifying. Victims suffered the agony of having gruesome ulcers destroy their faces, the skin appearing to be rotting away. In some heartbreaking instances, the victims' noses, lips, and other body parts were completely removed, leaving them deformed and doomed to agony. This gruesome outbreak emerged as a real-world equivalent of a zombie apocalypse. Did you know that turkeys were once worshipped like gods? Turkeys held immense significance in ancient Mayan culture. Around 300 BC, the Mayans revered turkeys as vessels of the gods and incorporated them into religious rites. These birds symbolized power and prestige and were domesticated for their role in ceremonies. They appeared extensively in Maya iconography and archaeology, representing fertility, abundance, and spiritual connections. Today, while turkeys are favored as a Thanksgiving meal in America, their historical importance in Mayan civilization highlights their sacred status and cultural significance in ancient times. Did you know that there's a popular tale about Napoleon Bonaparte being attacked by bunnies during a rabbit hunt? Napoleon, renowned for his military prowess as the Emperor of the French, was an avid hunter. He enjoyed various hunting activities throughout his life. The description of the bunny onslaught as vicious and unstoppable adds a dramatic flair to the narrative. It paints a picture of an overwhelming force of bunnies charging fearlessly and relentlessly towards Napoleon and his men, catching them off guard and creating a chaotic scene amidst what was supposed to be a leisurely hunting activity. 
While the attack of the bunnies story may lack historical authenticity, it has become a popular legend associated with Napoleon. In the 13th century, Pope Gregory IV believed that black cats were instruments of evil associated with Satan himself. Fueled by this belief, he ordered the elimination of cats throughout Europe. However, this decision had dire consequences that no one could have foreseen. Without the presence of feline predators, rat populations thrived and multiplied without restraint. The absence of cats, the natural predators of rats, disrupted the ecological balance, allowing the plague-carrying rats to spread the disease unchecked. And here's where it gets truly alarming. Rats were carriers of the bubonic plague, a deadly disease that swept through towns and cities, resulting in the devastating Black Death, claiming millions of lives and leaving a lasting impact on society. Did you know that between 1913 and 1915, people mailed their babies? On January 1st, 1913, post offices started accepting packages weighing more than four pounds, but there were no clear rules on what you could and couldn't send through the mail. People started pushing its boundaries right away by mailing eggs, bricks, snakes, and other odd packages. One couple immediately exploited this. Their newborn boy will be delivered using the postal service's new parcel service. The Beegs sent the boy to the mailman, who dropped him off a mile away at his grandmother's house, after they had paid 15 cents for his stamps, and an undisclosed sum to insure him for $1.50. The head curator of history at the National Postal Museum back then says she has found seven other instances of people mailing children between 1913 to 1915, beginning with that baby in Ohio. It wasn't common to mail your children, yet for long distances, it would have been cheaper to buy the stamps to send a kid by railway mail than to buy her a ticket on a passenger train. Did you know that in ancient times, the Scythians, a nomadic people of central Eurasia, employed a unique tactic in warfare? According to historical accounts, they utilized poisoned arrows as one of their specialties on the battlefield. These arrows were said to be tainted with a concoction consisting of viper venom, viper corpses, human blood, and feces. As depicted in the book, Greek fire, poison arrows, and scorpion bombs, biological and chemical warfare in the ancient world. These arrows were not only deadly due to the venomous mixture, but also posed a risk of infection. The combination of human blood and fecal matter on the arrows could lead to gangrene, tetanus, and other infections if a person was wounded. Moreover, the potent smell emanating from the poison projectiles was noted by Strabo, the Greek geographer, who observed that even those not directly wounded by the arrows would suffer from the terrible odor. Did you know that throughout history, there are captivating stories that blur the lines between fact and legend? One such tale revolves around the enigmatic Roman Emperor Caligula and his beloved horse, Incitatus. He provided the horse with a luxurious lifestyle, including a marble stall, an ivory manger, and a jeweled collar. Some sources claim that Caligula planned to make Incitatus a consul, the highest position in the Roman Republic, but these accounts are disputed. Caligula's reign was marked by a mix of political accomplishments and erratic behavior, and the stories of his relationship with Incitatus have contributed to his notorious reputation. The story of Incitatus, the horse consul, remains debated. Some sources claim it contributed to the Roman emperor's assassination. Write in the comments below if you think if this is fact or fiction. So, did you know that throughout history, there are captivating stories that blur the lines between fact and legend? One such tale revolves around the enigmatic Roman Emperor Caligula and his beloved horse, Incitatus. He provided the horse with a luxurious lifestyle, including a marble stall, an ivory manger, and a jeweled collar. Some sources claim that Caligula planned to make Incitatus a consul, the highest position in the Roman Republic, but these accounts are disputed. Caligula's reign was marked by a mix of political accomplishments and erratic behavior, and the stories of his relationship with Incitatus have contributed to his notorious reputation. The story of Incitatus, the horse consul, remains debated. Some sources claim it contributed to the Roman Emperor's assassination. Write in the comments below if you think if this is fact or fiction. So, did you know that the first recorded human flight in the UK was that of an English monk? The legend claims that in the year 1005, Aylmer of Malmesbury constructed a set of wings for himself. He scaled the tower and sprang from it, able to glide into the wind for nearly a furlong. That's about 200 meters or 220 yards. He may have worried a little, but the headwind was tremendous and he ended up drifting off to the side and crashing. Writings regarding the incident claim that although he survived the collision, he shattered both of his legs and lived the rest of his life with a limp. 
He reasoned that if he had also created a tale for himself, he would have had more success. Did you know that contrary to popular belief, the story that witches were burned at the stake during the Salem witch trials is inaccurate? The misconception can be attributed to the association of witchcraft trials with burnings in different historical periods. In reality, during the trials in 1692 to 1693, only 20 individuals were convicted of witchcraft and sentenced to death, but they were hanged rather than burned. Although the Salem witch trials was a tragic and dark chapter in history, characterized by wrongful accusations and flawed legal proceedings, it is essential to emphasize that none of the convicted individuals were executed by burning, debunking the popular misconceptions surrounding the trials. Did you know that a heroic dog named Juliana earned two Blue Cross medals for her valorous deeds during World War II? One of her most amazing exploits involves urinating on a live bomb to put it out. Juliana, a Great Dane, belonged to a family whose shoe shop in England was frequently bombarded throughout the war, particularly during the infamous Blitz period. When a shell fell through the roof of Juliana's owner's home in 1941, it didn't explode right away. Juliana approached the burning bomb and urinated on it in an act of extraordinary instinct or great nervousness, magically neutralizing the device. This brave action possibly saved everyone's lives because it stopped the bomb from causing extensive damage. The likelihood is high that the bomb's explosion would have destroyed the entire house and everyone inside, maybe setting off a fire that might have spread to nearby structures. What do you think? Was this just a case of chance or was this the dog's natural desire to defend its owners? Did you know that a French ship sank nearby Hartlepool, England during the Napoleonic Wars in the 19th century? According to legend, the lone survivor was a monkey decked out in military costume, whom the villagers mistook for a French spy. The monkey was then taken on trial and then hanged as punishment. The legend of the monkey hangers has become a part of local folklore, with Hartlepool residents affectionately referred to by that term. It emphasizes the perils of making fast decisions and the tense atmosphere that characterizes times of war. Today, Hartlepool celebrates its distinctive moniker as a representation of its identity and sense of community, incorporating the legend into everyday customs. Did you know that between 1913 and 1915, people mailed their babies? On January 1st, 1913, post offices started accepting packages weighing more than four pounds, but there were no clear rules on what you could and couldn't send through the mail. People started pushing its boundaries right away by mailing eggs, bricks, snakes, and other odd packages. One couple immediately exploited this. Their newborn boy will be delivered using the postal service's new parcel service. The Beegs sent the boy to the mailman, who dropped him off a mile away at his grandmother's house, after they had paid 15 cents for his stamps, and an undisclosed sum to insure him for $1.50. The head curator of history at the National Postal Museum back then says she has found seven other instances of people mailing children between 1913 to 1915, beginning with that baby in Ohio. It wasn't common to mail your children, yet for long distances, it would have been cheaper to buy the stamps to send a kid by railway mail than to buy her a ticket on a passenger train. Did you know that in the 19th century, when understanding of asthma was limited, doctors would occasionally prescribe smoking as a remedy? The belief was that inhaling tobacco smoke could relax the bronchial tubes and alleviate asthma symptoms. However, this practice stemmed from misconceptions and an incomplete understanding of the risks involved. At that time, the negative health effects of smoking were not widely recognized. As medical knowledge evolved, it became clear that smoking posed significant hazards and worsened respiratory conditions. Today, smoking is universally discouraged as a treatment for asthma due to its harmful effects. This serves as a reminder of how medical practices can change with advancing knowledge and the importance of evidence-based approaches to healthcare. Did you know that in ancient times, the Scythians, a nomadic people of central Eurasia, employed a unique tactic in warfare. According to historical accounts, they utilized poisoned arrows as one of their specialties on the battlefield. These arrows were said to be tainted with a concoction consisting of viper venom, viper corpses, human blood, and feces. As depicted in the book, Greek fire, poison arrows, and scorpion bombs, biological and chemical warfare in the ancient world, these arrows were not only deadly due to the venomous mixture, but also posed a risk of infection. The combination of human blood and fecal matter on the arrows could lead to gangrene, tetanus, and other infections if a person was wounded. 
Moreover, the potent smell emanating from the poison projectiles was noted by Strabo, the Greek geographer, who observed that even those not directly wounded by the arrows would suffer from the terrible odor. Did you know that during the Battle of Agincourt in the 14th century, dysentery swept through the English army's ranks? The men were weakened by this, and their determination were crumbling. The archers were caught in the grips of this unrelenting disease, but because they had little access to proper sanitation, they were unable to escape. But undeterred by their predicament, these valiant men sought to overcome adversity with resourcefulness. In an act born of necessity, some archers, it is said, resorted to removing their lower garments. By relinquishing their pants, they aimed to alleviate the discomfort caused by dysentery, seeking relief from its constant grip. Thus, these English archers took to the battlefield, their lower limbs exposed to the elements, determined to fulfill their duty. With each arrow loosed, they braved not only the tumultuous clash of swords, but also the harrowing trial of controlling their own bodies. During the Middle Ages, a period characterized by prevalent superstitious beliefs, there existed a particularly daunting superstition that instilled deep fear in the populace. A significant number of devout individuals who regularly attended church placed great reliance on the notion that churches served as sanctuaries against malevolent forces. However, it is intriguing to note that a widely circulated belief suggested the possibility of demonic possession if one were to inadvertently fall asleep within the sacred confines of a church during a mass. While a few accounts detailing such incidents were recorded, none have been definitively substantiated. There persists speculation that these rumors may have been intentionally propagated by the church itself, with the objective of ensuring unwavering attentiveness among the congregation during religious ceremonies. I cordially invite you to share your perspectives on whether these superstitions stem from actual experiences, or if they represent a strategic ploy devised by the church. Did you know that during World War II a Polish unit adopted a bear cub? They named him Wojtek, meaning the little one. He eventually grew into a gentle giant who playfully wrestled with the men, and when the regiment was sent to Italy in 1943, Wojtek enlisted to go with them. He was even issued a military number and the rank of private. Wojtek assisted in the crucial role of supplying frontline troops during the intense combat for Monte Cassino by hauling bulky shells and crates of ammunition. The image of Wojtek carrying shells was later incorporated into the company's insignia. Following the war, Wojtek and his regiment traveled to Scotland, where he eventually settled down and remained there until his passing in 1963. Did you know that Abraham Lincoln, probably one of the best presidents to serve the United States, is a member of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame? As a young man, Lincoln was thought to be a good wrestler due to his relatively long limbs. In fact, he only lost once in 300 encounters. In typical wrestling fashion, he was notorious for using profanity occasionally. Honest Abe actually issued a challenge to the crowd after winning a match, saying, I'm the big buck of this lick! Unsurprisingly, nobody dared to challenge the future 16th President of the United States to a fight. He was given the title of Outstanding American in the National Wrestling Hall of Fame because of his skill in the sport. Did you know that Li Yuan Hao, the founder of the Western Jia Dynasty, was assassinated by his own son for stealing the latter's fiance? Li, who was later known as Emperor Jingzong of Western Xia, was a successful and decorated emperor until his later years when he became increasingly tyrannical and obsessed with wine and women, an obsession which led him to steal his own son's fiance. According to the historical text, Li first met his son Prince Ninglinge's fiance in 1048 and was immediately besotted by her beauty. He spurned his relationship with his son and married the woman as his own empress. Prince Ninglinge was so outraged that he plotted to assassinate the emperor, but only succeeded in cutting off his nose in the attack. Though Li survived the initial assassination attempt, would succumb to his wound a few days later. Did you know that King Wu of Qin, a formidable warlord in ancient Qin during the Warring States era, died while attempting to lift a bronze cooking pot? King Wu was a powerful man who used an iron fist of tyranny. He once challenged Meng Yue, a friend of his, to lift a fabled bronze cooking pot known as a Ding. Lifting the Ding, which represented imperial might, was regarded as a sign of power and dominance. For the competition, King Wu selected a lavish red gong with dragon motifs. As he attempted to lift it, his grip slipped and the Ding crushed his leg, leading to his death. Meng Yue was unjustly blamed and received a death sentence. This tragic story serves as a warning on the dangers of overconfidence, 
and overestimating one's ambitions. In the heart of Mactan, a storied island in the Philippines, lies a tale that has been passed down through generations. According to local legend, the fearless warrior Lapu-Lapu, who famously defeated Ferdinand Magellan in the Battle of Mactan, was never truly vanquished. Instead, as the sun dipped below the horizon that fateful day, Lapu-Lapu was transformed into a stone guardian of the seas. While no one knows for certain what really happened to the legendary chieftain, some sources said that he died from his wounds after the Battle of Mactan. Others said he died of old age. But the absence of a written account about the country's first hero has given rise to myths and tales about the warrior. For centuries, fishermen have revered this enigmatic figure, believing that Lapu-Lapu's spirit continues to protect the waters of Mactan. As they set out to fish, they pay their respects by throwing coins at a stone shaped like a man, seeking his permission to venture into his territory. Did you know that in 1494, Europe experienced the closest thing to a real-life zombie outbreak? This forgotten and gloomy chapter existed amidst the brilliant splendor of Italy's Renaissance. As the Age of Discovery progressed, brave sailors returning from the New World unintentionally brought a terrible plague. This silent intruder found its way into the ranks of an entire French army, which then became the unwitting carriers, spreading the great pox throughout Europe. The disease was permitted to spread unabated at the time due to the absence of medical developments. The results were nothing short of terrifying. Victims suffered the agony of having gruesome ulcers destroy their faces, the skin appearing to be rotting away. In some heartbreaking instances, the victims' noses, lips, and other body parts were completely removed, leaving them deformed and doomed to agony. This gruesome outbreak emerged as a real-world equivalent of a zombie apocalypse. Did you know that King Henry I of England passed away from eating an eel in 1135? After enjoying a lavish feast of lamprey, a prized river eel delicacy, he met an unpleasant end. He had no idea that this indulgence would cause a terrible case of toilet trouble, which grew worse over time despite the best efforts of his visiting doctors and courtiers. As the evening unfolded, the discomfort that King Henry I experienced became increasingly agonizing leaving the royal court filled with deep concern and unease. Despite their desperate attempts to alleviate his suffering, the king's condition proved relentless and unforgiving. Sadly, the once powerful king was unable to withstand the effects of his unfortunate feast. The discomfort that started as a little inconvenience developed into a serious and crippling condition that caused his early death. The narrative of King Henry I emphasizes how unpredictable life's journey is, and how even the strongest people can be brought low by unforeseen twists and turns. Did you know that the most successful pirate in history was a woman? Ching Shi, the world's most successful pirate, was once a lowly prostitute in China. Fate led her to an unexpected union with the commander of the Red Flag Fleet. But their union was hardly your typical tale of love. Her husband valued her as an equal and saw her genuine potential. From that moment, Ching Shi's destiny changed at that point and she started leading the fleet's pirates as an active commander. She handled the perilous waters with tactical genius and unyielding resolve, leading her brave crew to incredible wins. Her legacy goes beyond the confines of gender norms, demonstrating the unbreakable character of a woman who defied expectations and attained the highest levels of authority. All who dared to face Ching Shi were terrified as her name reverberated across the oceans. With each conquest, her legend grew, inspiring us that strength knows no gender, and greatness can emerge even from unexpected origins. Was Alexander the Great buried alive? According to a recent study, the long-standing enigma surrounding Alexander the Great's passing has been solved. This paper claims that Alexander died from a rare autoimmune condition that slowly paralyzed his muscles, leaving him voiceless and motionless for six painful days. It means that the ancient Macedonian ruler was likely still alive while his loyal soldiers prepared his body for burial in 323 BC. His muscles were paralyzed to the point that doctors couldn't see he was still breathing, meaning he was pronounced dead nearly a week early. Alexander the Great, a celebrated military genius, had established the largest empire in the ancient world through a series of remarkable conquests. Against odds, his army conquered Persian provinces, Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt, unscathed. However, his enigmatic death at 32 in Babylon baffled historians for years, with theories spanning typhoid, alcohol, and poisoning. Did you know that a Roman emperor once declared war on the seas? 
Emperor Caligula, the third Roman emperor who ruled from 37 AD to 41 AD, is often depicted in historical accounts as a cruel, hot-headed, extravagant, and an unpredictable ruler. While on his way home from a failed invasion of Britain, feeling embarrassed and his pride wounded, he sought a spectacle to mask his retreat. It would be embarrassing to go home empty-handed, right? In an astonishing display of audacity, he declared war on none other than Neptune, the god of the sea. To his bewildered troops, the order was clear. Whip the restless waves into submission and bring forth the spoils of victory in the form of seashells. The absurdity of it all left the soldiers torn between disbelief and fear. For who would dare challenge a deity that governed the vast expanse of the ocean? Although historians aren't certain if this tale is accurate, the fact that many believed it reflects the king's illogical nature. Did you know that fermented milk was the key to the success of Genghis Khan's Mongolian Empire? One of the most powerful military empires in history was the Mongol Empire, ruled by the warlord Genghis Khan. Many factors led to their incredibly successful campaigns, including their warriors' high level of discipline, their skill with horses and archery, and their adaptability in absorbing and applying the methods and technology of those they battled and conquered. Over nine million square miles and a fourth of the world's population were once under the rule of the Mongol Empire. In the present era, it is nearly impossible to even consider such a high level of military dominance. One beverage in particular was beloved by the Mongols, given great societal importance and even some level of mystical power. The milk of the horses that were used to transport their armies was fermented to create Arag. The finished Arag had a low alcohol concentration of about 2% and a great nutritional value. Do you know who was the deadliest sniper in history? During World War II, a Finnish farmer named Simo Heha rose to fame as a famed sniper, taking on the Soviet Red Army with unparalleled accuracy with his trusty Mosin Nagant rifle. He acquired the moniker White Death after blending in with the wintry surroundings while dressed in a white camouflage outfit. In just 100 days, he recorded 505 confirmed kills, terrorizing his adversaries. His inspirational tale of fortitude and unmatched accuracy serves as a testament to bravery and the human spirit in the face of difficulty. The White Death's incredible run came to a halt in March 1940, when he was hit by a Soviet bullet. The round struck his jaw and ultimately shattered his face. Remarkably, he survived and regained consciousness just as the war ended. Despite his severe injuries, Heha lived to see the end of hostilities and the peace treaty that preserved Finland's independence. Did you know that Genghis Khan, the great Mongolian conqueror, known for his legendary empire and military strategies, also has some peculiar stories attributed to him? One such tale is the myth that he practiced urine drinking for its supposed health benefits. But is this truly the case or just a whimsical fabrication? Let's separate fact from fiction. You see, Mongolians, including Genghis Khan and his army, relied heavily on horses. Horse milk was believed to be a valuable source of nutrients for these nomadic warriors. However, somewhere along the line, this horse milk connection got distorted, leading to a humorous yet completely unfounded claim about Khan's odd habits. The tale of Genghis Khan's urine drinking habit has been a source of entertainment for history buffs worldwide. But let's not forget the true legacy of Genghis Khan as a brilliant conqueror and leader. Like and subscribe. Did you know that ancient Romans and Greeks reproduced so much that it caused a plant to go extinct? A herb called silphium was employed as a highly efficient contraceptive by the ancient Romans and Greeks. The odd thing is that they used it so extensively that it actually became extinct. Can you imagine that? Not only was it used as a contraceptive and in beverages, but silphium was also used for treating a variety of medical conditions such as coughs, sore throats, and indigestion. The significance of this extraordinary plant was even recognized by Julius Caesar, who stored an impressive stockpile of 1,500 pounds, 680 kilograms, in the official treasury. The loss of the silphium plant had significant consequences for the ancient Greeks and Romans. Without access to this effective form of birth control, the population of these societies may have grown at a faster rate, leading to increased competition for resources and potentially putting strain on their economies and environments. Five most sadistic sultans of the Ottoman Empire. One, Mehmed II. He ordered his infant brother be drowned. Then to put it out of his mind, he also ordered the execution of the guard who drowned his baby bro. Two, Sultan Selim I. In 1514, he had thousands of heretics rounded up and killed or imprisoned. 3. Suleiman I. 
Soon after becoming the tenth sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent did the not-so-magnificent thing of having two of his sons murdered, as well the four sons of the prince on Rhodes, after promising to them that he wouldn't. 4. Mehmed III. Upon becoming sultan, he murdered his 19 brothers, all children, and over 20 of his sisters. They were all throttled by the traditional royal executioners, servants who could neither hear nor speak five. Murad IV. The merciless Murad hated smoking so much that he effected a ban on smoking in 1633 and took to policing it himself. Which of these two city-states provided superior living conditions for its female residents? In Sparta and Athens, the treatment of women was different. Athenian women were no better than slaves to the men that surrounded them. They were not allowed to speak or even be seen in public. They lived most of their lives inside of their homes preparing meals and tending to the house. The only way they could leave to go out into the streets was if they were supervised by a man. Education was rare to them. Only a select few had any form of education, and even that was taught to them from inside their homes. Women in Sparta had freedom that most women did not have in these ancient times. This was in large part due to their inherent system, which permitted women to inherit an equal amount of wealth as men. As so many men were killed in battle, women often acquired large fortunes from both their parents and husband. Reading, writing, and oral traditions were also key parts of their education process. How did the 4,000 men of Baldwin IV beat the 20,000 soldiers of Saladin? Saladin, who later took over Jerusalem, commanded a vast army of between 15,000 to 20,000 warriors. On the other hand, King Baldwin IV only commanded a small force of 4,000 soldiers overall and was composed of several thousand infantrymen and about 400 knights. Rather than passively awaiting a defensive battle for Jerusalem, Baldwin assembled his limited forces and took Saladin by surprise in an offensive maneuver. Despite the unfavorable numerical balance for the Christian forces, what significance do odds hold in the perspective of divinity? Baldwin's crusaders decisively overpowered Saladin's troops, capturing and slaying the majority. Saladin narrowly escaped on a camel, fleeing the battlefield. In the Philippines, an intense conflict played out that would forever mark the sands with the crimson stain of battle. A confrontation between two opposing forces where the unimaginable transformed into reality. In the year 1520, Ferdinand Magellan and his troops embarked on a voyage with the conviction that their strength would triumph over all challenges. However, they had yet to encounter the unyielding wrath that awaited them. Apu, the chief of Mactan, led a formidable army tempered in the fires of determination. Tempered by countless generations of bravery, they stood as an impregnable barrier, concealed from the sight of those who belittled them. Blades clashed, life essence flowed, and agonizing cries reverberated through the atmosphere. The invaders soon realized that they were not up against mere mortals. They were confronting warriors driven by an unquenchable yearning to safeguard their autonomy. In the face of staggering odds, Magellan's expedition suffered a devastating downfall on the shores of Mactan. Did you know that King Mithridates VI was the only known king to be immune to poison? During the Hellenistic period, political intrigue and assassinations were not uncommon, and poisoning was a favored method of eliminating rivals. Mithridates' fear of being poisoned is said to have been rooted in the political and historical context of his time. So to guard against potential poisoning attempts, he reportedly began ingesting small, non-lethal doses of various poisons including plant extracts and minerals. The idea behind this practice was to gradually build up his body's tolerance and immunity to these toxic substances. However, the story takes an ironic turn when, facing defeat and capture by the advancing Roman forces led by General Pompey in 63 BC, Mithridates decided to take his own life by ingesting poison, but it did not kill him as he had anticipated. Faced with the failure of his suicide attempt, he resorted to asking a loyal friend to stab him instead. King Pygmalion of Tyre harbored an overwhelming and unhealthy fixation on his sister, Princess Alyssa. Consumed by an illicit and intense infatuation for her, Pygmalion sought to make Alyssa his own through marriage. However, his desires were met with outright rejection when Princess Alyssa steadfastly declined his proposal. Driven to extremes by the torment of unrequited love and a sense of entitlement, King Pygmalion resorted to using his military might to forcefully seize his sister. He dispatched a contingent of soldiers in pursuit of Princess Alyssa, intending to capture her and bend her will to his own. In her desperate bid to escape this dire predicament and evade her tyrannical brother's grasp, Princess Alyssa found refuge aboard a ship. 
King Pygmalion stood on the shore watching as the ship carried her away. It was at this moment that his love, twisted by obsession, transformed into an insurmountable misery. In an act of desperate surrender to his emotions, cast himself into the unforgiving sea and drowned. Do you possess the qualities necessary to become a Spartan warrior? You might have thoughts of Leonidas and his 300 comrades, but allow me to elucidate the harsh reality of a Spartan man's existence. The journey commences from the moment of birth, where infants deemed feeble or malformed faced a grim fate. For those who managed to survive this perilous beginning, the next crucible awaited them at the tender age of seven. Spartan boys were forcibly separated from their mothers and thrust into rigorous physical combat and battle training, where there was no room for vulnerability or sentiment. Then, at the age of 12, the ultimate trial commenced. Abandoned in the wilderness, they had to grapple with survival and self-sufficiency, where only the most robust could emerge victorious. Even after enduring all these trials, one would serve until the age of 60, if they reached that far, for many did not. So, I pose the question. Three ancient marvels of the world that have vanished from existence, the Lighthouse of Alexandria. Built in the 3rd century BCE on the island of Pharos, near Alexandria, Egypt, this lighthouse stood as one of humanity's tallest man-made structures for many centuries. Sadly, the lighthouse faced damage from multiple earthquakes and ultimately vanished from history during the 14th century. The Colossus of Rhodes. This enormous statue dedicated to the Greek sun deity, Helios, was a truly captivating sight. Built in 280 BCE, it had an impressive height of about 33 meters, one of the tallest sculptures of the ancient era. Sadly, it succumbed to an earthquake. Hanging Gardens of Babylon. This marvel was purportedly built by King Nebuchadnezzar II for his wife, who longed for the lush hills and valleys of her homeland. While no archaeological traces of these gardens have been uncovered, various ancient writings vividly depict a scene of luxuriant foliage, exotic flora, and intricate water systems. Did you know that February 15th marks the historical celebration of Lupercalia? This famous event, characterized by men running through the streets wearing garments made from sacrificed goats, a unique and vibrant expression of fertility and love. Lupercalia was a cherished annual tradition in ancient Rome, celebrated in honor of Faunus, the Roman god of agriculture, fertility, and shepherds. As part of the festivities, men would run through the streets, their bodies draped in goatskin, searching for women. The goal was not to harm, but to playfully strike these women with leather thongs, known as februa. This act was thought to bring blessings of fertility, health, and safe childbirth to those touched. Being struck by the leather thongs was seen as a form of protection against infertility and the difficulties associated with childbirth. Over time, the festival of Lupercalia evolved and merged with other celebrations. Eventually, it transformed into the modern Valentine's Day, emphasizing love and affection rather than fertility rights. Did you know that in 1923, Germany put Adolf Hitler in prison? During that year, Hitler led an unsuccessful coup known as the Beer Hall Putsch, with the aim of overthrowing the German government. However, this venture ended in failure, resulting in his imprisonment. He was subsequently convicted of treason and handed a five-year sentence in Landsberg prison. While serving his time in prison, Hitler found the opportunity to write a significant piece of work which laid out his future ambitions. This book was completed on December 20th, 1924. Remarkably, Hitler was released after just nine months of his five-year sentence. His time in jail had a profound impact on him, granting him a platform to disseminate his ideas and gather crucial support. Upon his release, Hitler's influence grew significantly, marking the inception of the Nazi party. Incredibly, Hitler's period of imprisonment played a pivotal role in shaping world history. Insane laws people had to live by in ancient Rome, part one, one. Prostitutes were required to dye their hair blonde or wear blonde wigs. Roman ladies all had naturally black hair. Natural blondes in Roman time were barbarians, especially the Gauls. Since the prostitutes couldn't be associated with the dignity of a proper Roman woman, they had to make themselves look like barbarians, so they made them dye their hair. Two, people killed by thunderbolts couldn't be buried. Lightning strikes, the Romans believed, were acts of God performed by Jupiter. If something got hit by a lightning bolt, it wasn't bad luck. Jupiter just really hated it. Whether it was a tree or a person, Jupiter had decided it was time for it to go. If it was your friend who got hit, you were legally forbidden to lift the body above the knees, and you definitely couldn't bury his body. If you did, 
you'd stolen a sacrifice from Jupiter. Have you ever wondered how a drinking session led to a significant conflict? The Battle of Karan Sepes stands as a legendary event that transpired during the Austro-Turkish War in 1788. Tensions were high in the Austrian camp as the Ottoman Empire's forces approached. As the night fell on September 21, 1788, Austrian soldiers encountered the Roma cellars and decided to indulge in some alcoholic beverages. What started as a harmless drinking gathering quickly escalated into a tumultuous spectacle. A dispute erupted between infantry and cavalry units, sparking a chaotic melee. Amidst the chaos, shots were fired and panic overwhelmed the encampment. Panicked soldiers believed they were under attack by the Ottoman army. In a tragic case of mistaken identity, they began firing at anything that moved. The night turned into a scene of unimaginable chaos, with hundreds of soldiers dead, injured, and hangover by morning. What made this battle astonishing is that the Ottomans hadn't even reached the area. Have you ever wondered how a drinking session led to a significant conflict? The Battle of Karan Sepes stands as a legendary event that transpired during the Austro-Turkish War in 1788. Tensions were high in the Austrian camp as the Ottoman Empire's forces approached. As the night fell on September 21, 1788, Austrian soldiers encountered the Roma cellars and decided to indulge in some alcoholic beverages. What started as a harmless drinking gathering quickly escalated into a tumultuous spectacle. A dispute erupted between infantry and cavalry units, sparking a chaotic melee. Amidst the chaos, shots were fired and panic overwhelmed the encampment. Panicked soldiers believed they were under attack by the Ottoman army. In a tragic case of mistaken identity, they began firing at anything that moved. The night turned into a scene of unimaginable chaos, with hundreds of soldiers dead, injured, and hangover by morning. What made this battle astonishing is that the Ottomans hadn't even reached the area. Islam's resolute resistance against Mongol aggression was exemplified in the Battle of Angelut, also known as the Battle of Goliath Spring, on September 3, 1260. Led by Sultan Kutuz and their renowned General Baibars, the Mamluks confronted the Mongols under the command of Kitbuka, a notable general serving Hulagu Khan in the Jezreel Valley. Although initially outnumbered, the Mongols held the advantage. Yet, Baibar's astute use of the terrain and effective hit-and-run tactics shifted the course of the battle. The Mamluks then launched a surprise assault, feigning retreat to catch the Mongols off guard. Arrows rained down upon the unsuspecting Mongols while they were attacked on their flanks by cavalry. This intense battle lasted for hours, resulting in heavy Mongol casualties. Ultimately, the Mamluks emerged victorious, forcing the Mongol army to retreat and halting their threat to Egypt and Syria. The Mamluks' triumph secured the survival of the Islamic world in the face of Mongol aggression. Islam's resolute resistance against Mongol aggression was exemplified in the Battle of Angelut, also known as the Battle of Goliath Spring, on September 3, 1260. Led by Sultan Kutuz and their renowned General Baibars, the Mamluks confronted the Mongols under the command of Kitbuka, a notable general serving Hulagu Khan in the Jezreel Valley. Although initially outnumbered, the Mongols held the advantage. Yet, Baibars' astute use of the terrain and effective hit-and-run tactics shifted the course of the battle. The Mamluks then launched a surprise assault, feigning retreat to catch the Mongols off guard. Arrows rained down upon the unsuspecting Mongols while they were attacked on their flanks by cavalry. This intense battle lasted for hours, resulting in heavy Mongol casualties. Ultimately, the Mamluks emerged victorious, forcing the Mongol army to retreat and halting their threat to Egypt and Syria. The Mamluks' triumph secured the survival of the Islamic world in the face of Mongol aggression. Have you ever thought about why Genghis Khan didn't try to take over India, even though it was a rich and culturally diverse place? Well, there are some important reasons for that. First, there was a big natural barrier in the way. The land between Genghis Khan's empire and India was really tough to cross. His soldiers were used to open plains, not steep mountains and thick forests, so it would have been hard for them to get there. Also, Genghis Khan had his armies spread out in different places, so it would have been difficult to organize a big attack on India. It was just too far away and too big to conquer all at once. Another reason is that Genghis Khan was smart. He knew how powerful the Delhi Sultanate is. And so, instead of fighting everyone, he understood the value of making friends with nearby empires that weren't a threat to his ongoing campaigns. This way, he could focus on expanding his empire in other directions without worrying about enemies on all sides. 
the weirdest pregnancy test in history, the wheat and barley test. Long ago, in ancient Egypt, there was a very strange way to check if someone might be pregnant. They would advise women who thought they might be pregnant to pee on some wheat and barley seeds over the course of a few days. If the wheat started to grow, they believed it meant the person was going to have a girl. If the barley grew, they thought it meant a boy. And if nothing grew, it meant they weren't pregnant at all. Surprisingly, this weird test actually worked. In the 1960s, scientists tried it in a lab and found that about 70% of the time, the urine of pregnant people made the seeds grow, but the urine of non-pregnant people did not. The reasons behind this phenomenon are not entirely clear, but it's believed that the hormonal changes in the urine of pregnant individuals might have contributed to the seed growth. The ancient Egyptian wheat and barley test, though bizarre to our modern sensibilities, had a surprising degree of accuracy and was a testament to the ingenuity of ancient cultures. Insane and Bizarre Customs in History, Part 1. In ancient Rome, the beauty industry was truly unique. Forget about fancy serums and lotions. Roman ladies preferred pots filled with gladiator sweat as their skincare secret. Rumor has it they thought it gave them a gladiator-like glow. Perhaps it's time to raid the gym locker room for some DIY facial treatments? Now, the Vikings, oh boy. They had quite the send-off for their masters. When a master passed away, a slave girl was expected to join him in the afterlife. But before her grand exit, she had to play a little game of Viking Tinder with a man from every household. Talk about an otherworldly experience. Lastly, the Egyptians, well, they had a rather crappy contraceptive method, crocodile dung. Yep, you read that right. It might have worked, but let's face it. Who's in the mood for romance when your love nest smells like a reptilian restroom? Dirty facts about ancient Greece you didn't know. Once a year in Athens, the city's streets turned into a lively parade of, well, you guessed it, phalluses. Men and women proudly paraded through town, hoisting colossal phalli in the air to pay homage to their wine-loving deity, Dionysus. It was all part of a Dionysian bash, where people got as drunk as a skunk and led a naughty phallic procession to the temple, serenading their way with songs about private parts and cracking risque jokes at unsuspecting folks. But wait, there's more. Slaves in ancient Greece endure something called infibulation. That meant that metal rings were snugly wrapped around their genitals, making any form of excitement a painful endeavor. And the only way to release the lock was with a special key. Talk about a real-life escape room. Now, for the grand finale of absurdity, sneezing as a birth control method. Yes, you read that right. The Greek physician Soranus once advocated that post-lovemaking, all a woman needed to do was squat, sneeze, and rinse, and voila, no pregnancy. It's like they were taking a chew to a whole new level of contraception. Did you know that in 161 AD, Roman Emperor Antoninus Pius passed away in the most embarrassing manner possible? Antoninus was a rare diamond among Roman emperors. He was adored by his followers, famous for his moderation and sound counsel, and lucky enough to escape the wrath of envious rivals or displeased relatives. He actually had a long and successful life, living to the amazing age of 75, before a sudden culinary tragedy struck him. According to legend, Antoninus indulged in a decadent alpine cheese one fatal evening while eating dinner. He had no idea that his passion for fromage would lead to his downfall. He awoke the next morning suffering from a severe fever that showed no mercy. The old emperor's plight progressively got worse as the days went by, eventually leading to his death. This beloved emperor, who was known for having a sophisticated palate, spent his final years in his opulent house in the town of Lorium, where he met his cheesy demise. Did you know that Cleopatra and Mark Antony in 41 BC, founded a drinking club known as the Inimitable Livers. This exclusive club was purportedly dedicated to the Greek deity Dionysus, 
the god of wine and festivities. Cleopatra and Mark Antony, known for their opulent lifestyles, established this extraordinary gathering to honor and celebrate the divine essence of wine and revelry. They played jokes on Egyptians while disguising themselves, gave expensive dinners, and enjoyed in drinking. It's still unclear what the club was for. Some people think it was to glorify Dionysus, while others see it as a cover for vice. Despite doubts, this episode emphasizes Mark Antony and Cleopatra's lavish lifestyle and their pursuit of fun and celebration. Did you know that a French ship sank nearby Hartlepool, England during the Napoleonic Wars in the 19th century? According to legend, the lone survivor was a monkey decked out in military costume, whom the villagers mistook for a French spy. The monkey was then taken on trial and then hanged as punishment. The legend of the monkey hangers has become a part of local folklore, with Hartlepool residents affectionately referred to by that term. It emphasizes the perils of making fast decisions and the tense atmosphere that characterizes times of war. Today, Hartlepool celebrates its distinctive moniker as a representation of its identity and sense of community, incorporating the legend into everyday customs. Did you know that Nikola Tesla, the renowned inventor, openly hates overweight people? He often openly expressed his disgust for overweight people and even fired his secretary because of her weight. In terms of treating other people, Nikola Tesla was not exactly a kind guy. However, when he did participate in social activities, everyone who encountered him always had nothing but praise for him, describing him as refined, sweet, sincere, and gentlemanly. He was also highly a social and isolated himself from others with his work. In contrast to past instances, he acted in this manner. He was quick to criticize attire and frequently ordered a subordinate to go home and change her clothes. This decision reveals a less favorable side of the celebrated inventor, leaving many puzzled and questioning the complexities of this renowned historical figure. Was Abraham Lincoln a vampire hunter in real life? Most likely not. Or if there was, there isn't any concrete evidence of it. The 16th president, according to Seth Graham Smith's book, is seeking retribution after seeing his mother slaughtered by bloodsuckers. In reality, Lincoln actually did witness the death of his mother, but it wasn't vampires that killed her. It was something called milk sickness. When Abraham Lincoln was nine, Nancy Hanks Lincoln passed away. She caught the illness through consuming cow's milk that had been fed white snake root. Puking fever, sick stomach, weakness, severe muscle stiffness, bad breath, trembles and eventually coma followed by death were common symptoms for milk sickness. Truth be told, that sounds a lot worse than vampires. <laughs> Did you know that between 1913 and 1915, people mailed their... babies? On January 1st, 1913, post offices started accepting packages weighing more than four pounds, but there were no clear rules on what you could and couldn't send through the mail. People started pushing its boundaries right away by mailing eggs, bricks, snakes, and other odd packages. One couple immediately exploited this, their newborn boy will be delivered using the postal service's new parcel service. The Beegs sent the boy to the mailman, who dropped him off a mile away at his grandmother's house, after they had paid 15 cents for his stamps, and an undisclosed sum to insure him for $1.50. The head curator of history at the National Postal Museum back then says she has found seven other instances of people mailing children between 1913 to 1915, beginning with that baby in Ohio. It wasn't common to mail your children, yet for long distances, it would have been cheaper to buy the stamps to send a kid by railway mail than to buy her a ticket on a passenger train. Did you know that a heroic dog named Juliana earned two Blue Cross medals for her valorous deeds during World War II? One of her most amazing exploits involves urinating on a live bomb to put it out. Juliana, a Great Dane, belonged to a family whose shoe shop in England was frequently bombarded throughout the war, particularly during the infamous Blitz period. When a shell fell through the roof of Juliana's owner's home in 1941, it didn't explode right away. Juliana approached the burning bomb and urinated on it in an act of extraordinary instinct or great nervousness, magically neutralizing the device. This brave action possibly saved everyone's lives because it stopped the bomb from causing extensive damage. The likelihood is high that the bomb's explosion would have destroyed the entire house and everyone inside, maybe setting off a fire that might have spread to nearby structures. What do you think? Was this just a case of chance or was this the dog's natural desire to defend its owners?
Did you know that a French ship sank nearby Hartlepool, England during the Napoleonic Wars in the 19th century? According to legend, the lone survivor was a monkey decked out in military costume, whom the villagers mistook for a French spy. The monkey was then taken on trial and then hanged as punishment. The legend of the monkey hangers has become a part of local folklore, with Hartlepool residents affectionately referred to by that term. It emphasizes the perils of making fast decisions and the tense atmosphere that characterizes times of war. Today, Hartlepool celebrates its distinctive moniker as a representation of its identity and sense of community, incorporating the legend into everyday customs.